Okay. Uh, so we want to take. Let's take a look at um, a good old an old friend. Um, so do you guys remember uh, this limit? We did quite a while back. So you guys remember we graphed it, and so if you notice, if you plug in zero, you get zero over zero, right? Uh, but there isn't really any algebra you could do. There isn't really much um, you can do here, right? Um, so um, you're kind of left a little bit in, in the uh, dark. We know that it's one, and we did this graphically, right? Okay, so uh, what we need is a theorem. We need a theorem. Now, this is a good theorem. It's got a cool name, uh, and um, it 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 helps us when. Um, so it it is not a easy theorem to use, but often it's the only theorem that that will uh, will work, and it'll help us with these kinds of things. So um, so let's say um, well. Let me give you guys the idea and then we'll write down the theorem. Deal? Deal. So here's the idea. The idea is, is the following. Let's say, for example, um, you have, uh, let's say you know, okay, so let's say you have this orange function and let's say you know it looks kind of like that, right? And let's say you have this green function. Let's call it G. And let's say that your function, uh, let's see, I guess we'll call it H of X. Okay, so like let's say for example this is kind of like a picture of this is sort of the idea is you have this purple function which I dotted this is H but let's say that you know so you don't have the whole picture but let's just say that you know for sure that H of X is between uh, let's see F of X and G of X you know this for sure yeah, and then let's say, uh, so I'm gonna pick, let's see, right uh, here. Let's call this C. <clears throat> um, do you guys agree that the limit as X approaches C of F of X is equal to the limit as X approaches C of G of X? On the, just by looking at the picture. Well, you have to use your imagination a little bit. They don't quite, so pretend like they touch right there. Where's C? You have to use your imagination just a little bit. Pretend they touch. So then they would be equal, right? Yes. Okay. Now, so if you know that H of X is between those two functions and uh, the limit as X approaches C of F of X, which is this function, and g of x, which is the bottom one, what do you also know about the function that's in between? Has the same exact limit, right? So that's really, that's the squeeze theorem, is that if you know these two things, uh, this inequality basically, and that the limits are equal, then it's like you can fill in this blank right here, right there. So. So the idea to use the squeeze, squeeze theorem basically is you need to find two functions that squeeze the one that you're interested in um, and uh, find the limit that way. So that's the idea anyways. Um, so does the idea make sense? Okay, so let's write it down and then we'll do an example. Uh, so let's, let's write it down. So the squeeze theorem, squeeze theorem. Um, okay, so suppose 
uh, F, G, and H are uh, um, continuous on some interval. Uh, let's call it just capital I. So just you know some interval, um, and the following are ah, uh, are uh, satisfied, and I'll number them just to make it a little bit easier. So let's see. We call the h of x is between. So the actual letters themselves aren't aren't important. Um, I just wanted it to match the picture that I gave you earlier. Um, but basically, h of x is in between g and f, right? Um, and then the other important condition is that the limit, as x approaches c, of g of x, equals to say some number l. And that's the same as the limit as x approaches c of uh, f of x. OK, so if those two conditions are satisfied, then the limit as x approaches c of the function in the middle, what does that have to equal? It has to also equal to l. So that's what the squeeze theorem tells you. And every theorem. When you use theorems, basically that's what you want to do, is you have these conditions. So if these conditions are met, then so-and-so is true, right? So when you're going to use a theorem, you have these conditions. And so basically you need to show that the conditions are true, and then you can say, okay, well then by the squeeze theorem, I know that this is also going to be true. Sound like a plan? Okay. So let's start off with a with a relatively simple example here, um, and then we'll do the one that we uh, presented in the beginning. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so let's say you have the limit as x approaches zero of x squared times sine of one over x. Stop doing that. Okay. All right, now, if we follow our usual technique, what do we do first, always? Plug it in, right? So we plug in zero, and it gets a little bit weird because what is this? This is zero times, what's sine of one over x? So it's zero times, who knows? Uh, or you can say zero times does not exist. I mean, if we kind of look at sine of one over x, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on, on this, but what is, what's one over x going to? What is that? Well, x is going to zero, which means one over x is going to infinity or negative infinity, depending on which direction you're coming from, right? And so what is the limit of sine to either of these, infinity or minus infinity? Mm -mm. It oscillates, right? So, but does it ever stabilize at one or minus one or any other number for that matter? No, right? So it just, so this just keeps, so basically this oscillates so we would actually say that the limit does not exist there, right? For sine of one over x. So then, but it's not, so we're not looking at just sine of one over x, we're looking at sine of one over x and that's being multiplied by some other function that's going towards zero. Okay, now, do you guys agree that we do currently do not have any technique to help us in this situation? Like, can you think of an algebra thing you could do to simplify it? Can you think of like a trig identity you could use here? Also no, no dice, nothing. But we have something. 
what is our assumption? A new tool. It's like going to Home Depot and getting a new tool that you knew you needed for your whole life. <laughs> and you finally went and got it. You were too cheap to buy it, maybe. But then you buy it and you're like, how did I ever live without this? But it could be other things, you know, that's that's the analogy that I, that I can relate to. But uh, I don't know, what other things? But you guys have had that happen to you, right? Where has this been all my life? That's like the squeeze theorem. Where have you been all my life? Okay, all right. I see that the feeling is not there, but okay. <laughs> feeling is not there okay no worries we'll get there okay now so what we need to do is so let's go back and take a look what do we need well um, we need to come up with these these functions right but uh, it's a little bit hard because it kind of seems like you just need to come out come up with these functions out of out of thin air uh, because you need to find well two functions that squeeze your your function well that's kind of weird right do we ever do that kind of stuff? Well, not really. Um, but let, it's, it's, I guess, the good news is that the kinds of uh, limits that you will have to evaluate using the squeeze theorem, um, it will be easy to find those two functions. And I'll show you how. So, for example, do you guys agree that sine of 1 over x is always bounded by two constants. Negative one and one, right? One, negative one, and one to zero, so a high ability. Yep. Yeah. So if you just think of just the normal sine function, it never uh, gets larger than one or smaller than minus one, right? Okay. So it's always between minus one and one. Okay. Now, this is not the function we're interested in. We're interested in x squared times sine of 1 over x. Okay, take a wild guess as to what the next step is going to be. Craziness. Craziness, I know. Multiply. Multiply everything through by x squared. Look at that. And now, what just happened? Well, now we know that x squared sine of 1 over x is going to be between two functions. What are they? negative x squared and positive x squared. Okay. Now this only helps us if those two functions that, the two functions <coughs> that we find that, um, that surround, that are squeezing our function, it only helps us if they actually do squeeze the function. For example, so you don't have to write this down, but just to drive the point home, uh, this is I would, all, I would be correct in saying, for example, this, right? You guys agree that, it's, that that inequality is true? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's not true. That's not what I wanted. Uh, Well, okay, how about this? Now I'm, I've dug myself into a bit of a hole here, but that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself out of it. Okay, all right, do you guys agree with that? If I'm between minus 1 and 1, then that's true. Yes? A? Oh, this? Oh, that means element of. So basically, it's in the interval between minus 1 and 1. Okay, now, do you guys agree with that line right there? <laughs> you should, because sine of 1 over x is always between minus 1 and 1, right? If x is always between minus 1 and 1, so x is small, right? So can this be more than 100? No, right? It's not more than 100. Do you guys agree with that? Definitely not more than 100? Yes? Okay, just say yes to help me out here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anyways, the point is, so you guys don't even have to write this down, but what uh, the point that I wanted to make is this actually does not help me. Why? Because what's the next step? 
the limit as x approaches 0 of this function and this function have to be what? The same, right? Otherwise, the squeeze theorem is not going to do anything for me, right? So, so you can't just make up any function that you feel like and just say, oh, well, it's between these two. Because then you, it might be true, but then it might not be true that the limit, that it actually does squeeze the function, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. So for example, here, right here. Okay. So I'm just keeping, I'm just going because you guys are not telling me definitively. Okay. Do you guys agree with that? Okay. Good. Good job. Now, uh, does that satisfy the second condition of the squeeze theorem? No. Absolutely not, right? Because what do we need? We need that to be equal, right? The same exact number. Here, I mean, it's true that it's, bet it's between minus 100 and 100, but who cares, right? If it's not the same limit, then it's not going to help us. Okay. All right. So now let's go back. So hopefully you guys did not write that down. Okay. Let's see if I can undo enough times. Oh, no. All right, so let's go back to what we had. Let's go back to what we had. So what did we have? We had negative x squared and x squared. Now, so here, condition one, check. So that's like a, our little check checkpoint. All right, now, uh, what's the second condition? Our second condition was that the uh, limit as x approaches 0 of minus x squared has to equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x squared, meaning these two functions have to have the same limit. Are they the same? Sure, right? Plug in 0. You're good to go. Condition 2, check. All right, so let's just kind of go back here just real quick. So what I've showed is that I've found two functions that bound my function, and then I showed that the limit for the larger function and the smaller function are equal. So then what does the squeeze theorem tell me? So I can say, so by the squeeze theorem, By the squeeze theorem, what can I now say? The limit as x approaches what? Zero, Zero of? Mm -hmm. Is equal to? Zero. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So questions on that. Does that make sense? Is that? You guys want to try one? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to give you guys one to try. You ready? Try. Uh, let's see. How about the limit as x approaches infinity of, uh, let's say, 1 over x times, um, oh, I don't know, cosine of x, let's say. Okay, so um, all right. So the idea is, so we have the two conditions, right? So let me go back here. So we need to find the two functions that bound our function, and then those two functions should have the same limit so that it actually gets squeezed. So um, typically that's the hard part. Um, so what we do is we start with, uh, something that we know. So an inequality that we know, right? So we know for sure that cosine of x is between what? Negative 1 and 1, right? So we're sure of this, yes? Okay. Then if I, so what I'm trying to find, wowzers. What I'm trying to find the limit of is this function though, right? 1 over x times cosine of x. So this inequality needs to have this function right here in the middle. Yes? So then what do I need 
to do to this to get it to look like 1 over x times cosine x? Well, just multiply by 1 over x, right? Or eh, divide through by x, let's say. And that's fine. You with me? Okay. Now, here we're not necessarily done. Um, so we're, we've satisfied the first condition, right? But then to really make sure that this is actually going to work, uh, we need to make sure that the limit as x approaches infinity of minus 1 over x has to, has to, has to equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of positive 1 over x. Yeah? And where are those two limits? Zero, right? So, okay, that's the second condition, right? Second condition satisfied? So then what can I say then? Yep. Now, that means I can use the squeeze theorem, right? So by the squeeze theorem, uh, the limit as x approaches to infinity of 1 over x cosine of x equals to 0. Does that make sense? Um, OK, so let me show you some pictures. Um, let's do, so one thing, um, let's see. The first one we had was, so let me, let me bring this up right here. So the first example we did was um, x squared times sine of 1 over x, right? So that's sine over x right there, right? And we've seen this one before. You guys remember we looked at, at this on the computer before where it just as the closer you get to 0, the more it oscillates, right? Um, so what does the x squared actually do? So like if you think of, for example, if I multiply this by 2, what happens to it? Changes the amplitude to 2, right? Or it stretches it vertically by 2, or by 3, or 4, or 5, right? But then what if you multiply by a function, like we are here? So let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, x squared, because that's what it is, right? That we're looking for. Um, but let me do something else. Let me graph positive x squared and negative x squared, which are the two functions that we said squeeze this. So see how see how our function is getting squeezed. Basically, the amplitude is changing with the function x squared, right? So notice how along all these points, See how the amplitude is basically however big the value of the, of the parabola is, right? And so then whatever it is, well, since the parabola is going to 0, that sine of 1 over x is getting multiplied by really, really small numbers, and that's what kind of shrinks it down to 0. Does that make sense? Just kind of more on an intuitive basis. So, um, okay, so then let's take a look at, uh, what's the other one? We did... Yeah, so we did, okay, so let me delete this one. So if I take a look at uh, cosine of x, right? Okay, why is this? Nothing, huh? There it is. Okay, so there's cosine, right? Um, and if I multiply it by... 1 over x. So notice in this one, I'm not looking for it at 0. Where am I looking at it? Yeah, as x goes to infinity, right? And these are my two functions. Uh, let's see. Can I restrict? Can I do that? No. Uh, can I? How do you tell it? I guess I don't know. Um, 
let's do this. So which one's ours? The one that we're interested in. It's the one in the red, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see how it's getting squeezed, right? By the two, the orange and the black one. So that's one over X and minus one over X. And if I look at it as X goes to infinity, it just keeps getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. It's similar, right? So the amplitude is basically whatever the uh, function is, right? One over X. And um, so as X goes to infinity, it just keeps getting smushed down to zero, basically. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions with the graphs or anything like that? Yes. Uh, there are some books that call the squeeze theorem the sandwich theorem. But then there's another sandwich. I think maybe it's called sandwich ham theorem. I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you study math and then all of a sudden you'll like hear this randomly named theorem. And you're like, you know, maybe they were, I don't know, <laughs> having a good day or a bad day. Who knows? Right? They're like, oh. I need to do something. I don't know. Okay. All right. So any um, any questions? Questions, questions, questions. No? All right. Are we ready to tackle our original problem? Because it's more challenging. Okay. So let's, let's do that. So what was our original problem? Our original problem was this limit here. All right. Now here... It's actually quite a bit uh, more challenging because, um, so notice that, so let's say that I try to do the same thing that I've been doing, like that, right? I started off there, but I have a problem. So I divide by x, let's say. Just like I've been doing, you know, exactly like the problem that we just did, right? Um, do you guys see a problem there? Houston. Yeah. Houston, we have a problem. Because what's the limit as x approaches 0 of this and this? Is that the same? No. Uh, it's not going to help us because, well... It's infinity or minus infinity, right? Mm -hmm. Infinity or minus infinity. Well, we already know graphically what is the, the limit. One. What should it be? Yeah, it should be 1. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the functions that we've chosen don't actually squeeze our function um, at 0. So that's why I said this is kind of the hardest part. Um, so, so like in this one, the first two we did, it was easy, right? You start with, oh, cosines between minus 1 and 1, and then just multiply it by the other part, and then you're good to go, right? But here, that doesn't work. So then what do we do? Well, and I would not expect you guys to come up with this uh, on your own um, at all. So if you're worried that I would ask you to do this on test, I mean, I guess after you've seen it, maybe, but I won't. Um, but let me show you a picture here. So hold on. Let me make it bigger, actually. So let me see. Maybe I'll do it over here, actually. So this is one. Uh, let's see. One. All right. There we go. Um, okay. Now, um, let me see here. So I'm going to draw three triangles here. Uh, I'm going to draw, let's see. No, hold on. Let me pick a better color. How about this one? Okay. So let's say I've got here this, and then the angle, let's call it X. Um, Okay, so let's say you take this triangle out 
all the way to one right there like that um, so this is the red triangle yes um, what's the area of this red triangle what's the base base which is one uh, what's the height um, no it kind of well it kind of looks like one there but it it actually is not one because it depends so here I mean so it, it depends on so this is just X is X can be anywhere from 0 to pi over 2 so you know if I mean it looks like this point right here matches up with that but it doesn't so just forget about that altogether because if it's lower then it won't and so um, okay so we know this is 1 right so think of your trig functions mm-hmm -mm. So, so, do you guys agree that this would be tangent of x? Why? Because tangent, remember, is opposite over adjacent, right? Well, what is adjacent? Adjacent's 1, right? So then what does, if the adjacent is 1, what does opposite have to be? tangent of x right so so basically the whatever so this height right here this height is tangent of whatever the angle is basically does that make sense if you fix the base to be one you with me okay all right so and then divided by two yes all right so that's the first triangle now uh, let's draw another triangle how about yellow let's say um, this triangle right here, yellow triangle, the area of the yellow. Now, can you guys see that? That doesn't look good, huh? Okay. I'll do this. Okay, there we go. Area of the yellow and black. Okay. So what's the area of the yellow triangle? Well, what's the base? One again, right? What's the height? So here, this is the height, right? Okay. And again, think of trig. Uh-uh. Sine, right? Because what is sine? Sine is this point right here. This is cosine x sine x right the x value on the unit circle is cosine the value of cosine and then the y value is sine right so then what's the height well that's just the y value right so sine and then so base the height is sine and then divided by two thumbs up okay third not not a triangle this time. Let's see. How about purple? Now the sector. The area of the sector. So imagine you're going to eat some pizza. Let's see here. Pizza, pizza. Hmm. The area of the sector. Purple sector. All right. Do you guys remember what the area of a sector is? Sector of a circle? I'll remind you here. Area of a sector. So think of it this way. Pi r squared, that's the area of a circle, a whole circle, right? Yes? Okay. Now, if you're going to take a section of it, a, a fraction of it, let's, so the angle notice is x, right? So let's say you're going to take x out of what's the total yeah out of 2 pi right because that's one full revolution um, so then well what's r here 
R is 1 in this case, right? That's the radius there. And then X. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. No, that's. Yeah, sorry about that. Not 2 theta. 2 pi. Ah. Oh, sorry. Let's go here. 2 pi. So the angle here is X this time. Uh, but 2 pi is one full revolution. So then what do I end up with then? Pi, the radius is 1. X over. Uh, well, 2 pi, right? Pi is to cancel, so we end up with x over 2. Yes? Okay. So the area of the sector is x over 2. Thumbs up? Yes or no? You guys agree with those three areas? Okay, now what, what in the world, what are we doing here? Well, uh, we're trying to make an inequality. So here, uh, let's see. Which one's the biggest? The first one, the red, right? The red is the largest area. So um, tangent of x over 2 is greater than, well, greater than or equal to, let's just say, greater than or equal to, what's the second largest? Which one? Oh, the sector, yes, purple, right? All right, the purple sector, which is x over 2. And then the smallest, the yellow, sine of x over 2. So far, so good? Okay, now you might be wondering why I wrote it, what looks like backwards. You'll see. Okay, now if you take this and, well, our goal is to get sine of x over x in the, in the middle, right? Okay, so let's multiply through by, let me pick a color here. We'll do gray. All right, multiply through here by 2 over sine of x. So what would that look like? Uh, let's see. So that cancels out all the 2s, right? And then tangent is sine over cosine. So then what is, what's going on there? What is sine over sine times cosine, so that would be 1 over cosine, right? Yes or no? Okay, good. Is greater than or equal to x over sine x, right? Okay, and that's greater than or equal to uh, 1, yes. All right, now we're close. Uh, what's the... Uh, yes. Well, I, I just, because you can multiply through by whatever you want, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> How do you decide what you want to come up with? Well, I came up with it. <laughs> well, why would I want that? Well, so, well, you'll see in the next step, because what's the next? So I came up with it, just like, well, just like you came up with multiplying through here by 1 over x. Almost, yes, that's right. So I'm not quite there, right? So I need to flip it. So what does flipping do to the inequalities? Yeah, it just basically reverses the inequalities, right? So if I reverse this, then, Then we have 1 over cosine of x is less than or equal to sine x over x is less than or equal to 1. Right? Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, after all of this, what do, what do we hope? Yeah, that they have the same limit, right? So this is the first condition, but we already saw earlier that if the first condition is easy to satisfy, the key is the second condition also has to be satisfied, right? So then you go, okay, well, if the limit does, the limit is x approach zero, right? Because we're going towards zero of cosine of x. What is that? 1, 
and the limit as x approaches 0 of 1, what is that? 1. And then what do we do? We go, hey! Woo! Oh, I can't, I don't have room. Okay, wait, how about this? Wait, I know. Oh. Oh, wait. Oh, smiley face, I was going to do. Okay. This makes us happy, right? Because then what can we say? By the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is 1. So it wasn't nearly as easy to um, do the work to come up with um, to come up with the inequality on that one, right? And we have to do this picture and all this stuff and then multiply by this 2 over sine x that seemingly came out of nowhere and then flip the inequalities and all that stuff, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so. Well, then your inequality wouldn't have come out, right? I mean, you you multiply by what, I mean, basically it's kind of like, so this is what you have, this is your inequality, um, and you're trying to get to this, for example. So then it's just a matter of kind of trying to make it work. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, for example, okay, so like this isn't the only approach. For example, let's say you take this right here, right? Do you guys see this inequality right there? Tan, what is that? Tan x, okay. So if I write down this, tangent of x over 2 is greater than or equal to x over 2, right? And so let's just say you work with that only and you're trying to get, so like your goal is to get sine of x, sine of x over x is something and something and something so you want to get somewhere so then you go okay well if I multiply through by 2 I can get rid of those and I can rewrite tangent as sine over cosine right so like I have that and then uh, I don't know you can divide by x maybe And then you get that, right? Should I divide by x on both sides? Like that? Uh, and then, well, then I can say, okay, well, sine of x over x is greater than or equal to cosine of x, right? <laughs> yes or no? Okay. So that's one part of my inequality. Notice this is exactly the same as this part right here. Isn't that the same thing that I ended up with? Sine of x over x is greater than or equal to cosine of x. So I just got it a different way, right? I just took that one, one part of the inequality, did some algebra, and then got one part of the inequality that I need. Have but then, oh yeah, go ahead. How do you get the cosine of x to the other side? The other side? Oh, I just multiply both sides. Oh. Yeah, just algebra. You know, So here at this point, you're just manipulating algebra. Um, and then if you wanted to, for example, take this section right here, x over 2 is greater than or equal to sine of x over 2. So then you can go, okay, well, x over, over 2 is greater than or equal to sine of x over 2. And then you do the same thing. Okay, let's multiply by uh, 2 both sides. And then what would you do? So again, this is your goal, sine of x over x and then... Divide by x, right? So then, okay, well, sine of x over x is less than or equal to 1. If I put this inequality together with that one, what, is, what does that tell me? That tells me that sine of x over x is between 1, right, on the right side, and then cosine on the left. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it isn't that you had to do it this way, you know, multiply by 2 over sine x. It's just the, that allowed us to do it in one, all at the same time, I guess. But you could just as easily have done it separately, taken the two inequalities separately and then worked with them um, that way. But always keeping in mind that this is kind of your goal, is sine of x, and then you need 
less than or greater than, right? And they can have equals, doesn't matter. Um, and um, so yeah, I mean, the only reason why we knew that this was going to get us to the right spot is because I told you. You know, this isn't like I said at the beginning. This isn't something that you would just come up with. It's like, oh well, let me let me draw this triangle, and then uh, I know I I have an idea. I'm going to compare the area of the sector with this triangle. You know, it's just it's it's something that you would come up with if you all you did was think about this problem for days and days and then you're like oh eureka i found it or something <laughs> um so but it's pretty cool right i mean you know it's cool stuff fun stuff um and, and so now we know why this is equal to one And so we'll use it later on. Um, <clears throat> if you do something similar, here another, so we have another important lim limit that I'll write down so that we have it. Important limit to memorize. memorize. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x. So this is equal to zero. Um, and maybe just a little note, um, this right here can be one minus cosine x or cosine x minus one. Either way, they're the same thing. Um, so if you do similar shenanigans like we just did, um, you can find that one. Actually, I think uh, if I remember correctly, you could. Yeah, you probably could actually. Uh, let's do it for fun. Eh, why not? Do you guys have an idea of something to do? Conjugate. Conjugate. That's a good idea. All right, we're going here on a on a whim here. I think this will work. All right, multiply by the conjugate of one minus cosine x. So what do I get? Limit as x approaches zero of, what's the top? Okay, good, over x times one plus cosine x, right? Now, what is one minus cosine squared x? That's sine squared, right? Okay. Aha, uh -huh. you guys see something? Aha, uh -huh. oh, hint, you use the limit we just found. Sine x over x, right? Do you guys see a sine x over x in here? Okay, so we can use that to our advantage. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x times what? Sine x, sine x over 1 plus cosine x, right? Now, what allows me to do this? Only if the two limits exist, right? Okay, now, do the two limits exist? Well, sure they do. Because we already know this one right here, that limit is the number 1, right? What's this one? What's the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over one plus cosine x? That's zero, right? Because if I plug in zero, you get zero over one plus one, right? Which is zero over two, which is zero. Okay, so they both exist. So that means you can, you can break it up. And so what is one times zero? That's zero. Ta -da. So those are the two uh, important trig limits to uh, to memorize for now, and because uh, we'll use them quite a bit. Um, any questions with that? No. Those are good. So we want to take a break. Okay, let's take a break.
We did this uh, graphically, I think. Do you guys remember what we got? Five, something like five. So at the time, we didn't really understand why it was five. But now, actually, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, because um, if you know that, um, so like if you look at it, for example, if the denominator here was 5x, let's say, what would that limit be? That would just be 1, right? That's the what we just proved. Um, okay, well, is there a way for us to get a 5 down there? Yeah, just multiply top and bottom by 5, right? So if I do that, that's okay, right? That's just multiplying by 1. So then what is that equal to? Yeah, that's just equal five equal to 5 times 1, right? So this is 5 times, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'll write it down this time, but just to make sure. But this is basically equal to 5 times the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 5x over 5x, like that, right? Which is just 5 times 1, which is 5, and you're done. Yeah? Easy, right? Okay. All right, so I'm going to give you guys one to try. So uh, keep in mind those two limits there. So there's sine of x over x and then the other one, 1 minus cosine x over x. Deal? Deal. Uh, so this looks like a good one. So theta instead of x. But. Remember I told you guys, you have to be comfortable not knowing exactly the direction you take, right? Because it's going to keep happening. So it's not like, um, so you know the feeling that you have right now where you're like, I have no idea how to start? That's completely normal. So you have to do something. So either, you know, think, and then you try something, and then if it doesn't work, go back and try something else. Um, but you need to try something. Okay, so I gave you guys a tip. Um, I said, well, why don't you try dividing by theta, right? Now, why did I suggest that? Well, I don't know. I saw this, and I'm like, well, I see a 1 minus cosine theta. If I can get a theta under there, at least I can use that, right? Um, am I sure it's going to work? No, uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, if I try it, for example, if I actually go through with this, and I simplify, what would I get? I would get theta... Well, theta over over that function, right? So like if I kind of think of it as these are the two parts, like I have theta over one minus cosine theta over theta. What's the limit of that? That is, if you plug it in, you get zero over zero, right? Because I know this limit is zero. So that's indeterminate. Well, what does that tell me? Yeah, I need to do more work, okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean I need to go back. It just means that I'm not quite there yet. So, well, what can we do? Um, uh, let's see. Well, I haven't used this one. So can I get a sign in there somehow? Okay. Sure, why not? Sure, why not? Okay, so if I multiply by sign... So sine theta times theta over sine theta times 1 minus cosine theta over theta. Okay, something like that, ish. Yeah? Okay. Um, well... Does that look nice? I don't know. Uh, let's see. How about, so how can I change the way this looks? Um, if I do, for example, this right here, that's, so if I have theta over sine theta, um, This is the same as 1 over sine theta over theta, right? What's that limit? 
So that's, yeah, that's one, right? So if this is one, and then this is zero, and what's this one? Zero. Does that, is that helpful? No. Okay, all right, so then what do I do? Okay, so I do this. Don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> okay, so then we go back. Okay, all right, so then, yeah, so we go back to the drawing board. All right, so now we need to think, think fresh, think new, think something else. Okay, good, good, uh, good idea. No, okay, bad idea, but good that you brought it up. Can I just do like something like that? Square root, top and bottom. What's the difference between that and what we've been doing? So like for example, here I divided top and bottom by theta. Yes, that was okay. Why is this not okay? What's the difference? It's not the same function anymore, right? If you get the square root of a function, that's not the same function you started off with, right? So you can multiply or divide by the same function, and that's okay, because that's like multiplying by one. But as if you get the square root of a function, that's different. You just change the function. Yes? Okay, good. All right, so I'm glad you suggested it, whoever did that. All right, so... All right, so we need fresh ideas. Somebody suggest something. Multiply by cosine. I heard conjugate. Did you guys try that? Well, let's try it. Got to try something, right? Okay, now conjugate worked well for us in the past, so might as well try, right? Okay, all right. So what is this equal to? All right, over one minus cosine squared, right? Okay. So this isn't looking too bad, right? Because what's one minus cosine squared theta? Ah, what? That's looking pretty good. Wowzers. All right, so notice how we went on totally the wrong track the first time, and uh, but that's okay, you know, we go back, regroup, try something different, right? No big deal. All right, so is this gonna get us anywhere? Sure it is, because what is that, what is the limit of this right here, this function? The limit as theta goes to zero of theta squared over sine squared theta, what is that? It looks kind of like that, right? But not quite. If I rewrite it as I don't know, how many steps should I take to rewrite it? Okay, I'll just do this. I'll just do two steps. Do you guys agree that this is the same as this? Yes or no? Okay. And do you guys agree that this is the same as this yes or no same thing right and so what is that's just one right each one of those is just one one over one times one over one is one so this is the number one and then what is what's this right here one plus cosine theta that's two, right? So what's the answer? Two. two. Yeah. Maybe you should have see, don't always listen to me. I don't <laughs> always know. <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean, see, the, the lesson to take from that is don't take tips too seriously. And uh, even I don't always know what to do first go. So there you go. You learned something. Okay. Any questions with that? No? You guys are good?